passage from Zechariah, chapter 4, the 10th verse. It says, Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that reigns throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Who dares despise the day of small things? What a fascinating verse. It kind of shines like a star from the darkness of the Old Testament when people were rebelling and doing their own thing, opposing God. The book of Zechariah deals with a portion of Israel's history after Babylonian captivity. They had come home, they were returning to Jerusalem, and Zechariah experienced a number of visions, and associated with one of them is this jewel. Who dares despise the day of small things? So let's talk about small things this morning. I mentioned last Sunday that we would spend some time with Moses throughout September. And so we turn our attention to Moses, and we discover that Moses felt like a very small man. In and of himself, his own perception, he felt very small. God had spoken to him from a burning bush and commanded him to return to Egypt to bring the Israelites out of slavery. You can read all about it in Exodus chapter 3. Moses began to backpedal. He said, God, who am I? I'm not worthy. I feel like a very small person. What will I say when they ask me questions? I don't have the answers. I'm afraid of being rejected. Please ask somebody that is more suitable. You see, 40 years previous to the burning bush episode, Moses had failed. And since that time, he had felt like a nobody. He felt like a very small man. But who has despised the, the day of small things? Moses did. He despised himself in his own eyes. He was a failure-fashioned, small thing. There's a true story of a project manager that worked for IBM. He made a big mistake, and he cost the company $10 million. This is true. Next day, he went into the president of IBM, and he submitted his resignation. And the president looked at his resignation and said, are you kidding me? We just invested $10 billion into your education. There's no way we're letting you go. Now get back to work. I like that. In God's opinion, our failures are not final. In fact, God will use our own failures to equip us to do better and bigger things. A middle-aged New York woman fell out of her apartment window and she fell into a garbage container. Just as that happened, a Russian diplomat walked by and said to his American friend, American people are so wasteful, that one woman was good for at least another 10 years. <laughs> Ron likes that. Sometimes you can laugh too hard. <laughs> Makes you wonder who he's thinking of. <laughs> God saw Moses and he saw that he was good for at least, at least another 40 years. It was too early to label him a failure. And so we pick it up in Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. The Lord said to Moses, what is that in your hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put out your hand and take it by the tail. This is where Moses and I park paths. <laughs> and he put out his hand and he caught it and it became a rod in his hand again. Verse 17, and you will take this rod in your hand and with it perform signs. And then we flip to verse 20, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. Now a rod is also a very small thing. It's not to be confused with a staff. A staff is a long stick with a crook on the end that a shepherd uses particularly for um, catching sheep so that they don't wander away and pulling them back into the fold. That's what a staff is. And Psalm 23 differentiates between a rod and a staff. So while some versions of the Bible talk, talk about how Moses took the staff, I did some research and the actual Hebrew word is rod. It's not to be associated with a staff. A rod is quite different. A shepherd would carry a rod and a staff, and the rod would be something, he would find a sapling, a young sapling, and he would dig it out of the ground. Shake all the dirt off it where the, the roots were, 
and try to take most of the roots off, but where the, the stem, the shaft meets the root ball, right at that hump, there's a little ball, he would polish that off as best as he could, and then he would whittle the, the, the stick, the shaft part, to fit his hand, and that would be a rod that he would use to protect the sheep from wild animals. And when they entered into the fold at evening, he would use that to count them, and sometimes to bop them on the head to get their attention if need be. Sheep aren't that swift, really. <laughs> and yet God says that we are the sheep of his pasture. You go figure. <laughs> a rod was something very small. And God said, throw that small rod on the ground. And, and immediately it became a writhing snake. Probably a cobra if we understand the geography. Dangerous. Dreadful. <clears throat> Moses jumped back, but God commanded, take it by the tail. And trembling and hesitant, Moses picked it up and it became a rod in his hand once more. And from that moment, that rod in Moses' hand was no longer a small thing. It looked the same, but now it was a miracle stick, infused by the power of God himself. So I'd like you to take a journey with me through the book of Exodus. <coughs> Sunday school teacher earlier on the screen introduced us to the book of Exodus. Exodus 4, verse 20, Moses took the rod of God with him to Egypt. So out of the wilderness he goes from the burning bush with this rod in his hand and he takes it back with him to Egypt. In Exodus 7, in the audience of Pharaoh, the rod is thrown down on the ground and it becomes a snake again, probably a cobra. Pharaoh's impressed. When the rod was placed in the Nile and stretched over the waters, the waters turned to blood. Pharaoh wasn't impressed. Exodus 8, the rod was, rod was used to make frogs move up on land and plague Egypt. The rod was used to strike the ground and cause the plague of gnats to infest Egypt. The plague of flies, hail, locusts, and darkness were all triggered by Moses and Aaron with the rod in their hands. Exodus 14, Moses parted the Red Sea by stretching forth the rod, and then it closed it up, closed it up again with the same rod. And then in Exodus 17, Moses struck a wilderness rock. Water gushed out of it, and in turn quenched the thirst of the parched Israelites. It's a lesson to not, dismot, dis, not despise small things. When God anoints something you might perceive as small, <clears throat> it can become very powerful. Do not despise small people like the children of our Sunday school class. God might be speaking to you through one of them. Do not despise yourself for any reason, including your past failures. If you think your talents are too insignificant to be effective, then you've never been in bed with a mosquito. Mm -hmm. Your life in God's hands, much more than that, changes everything. Do not despise your possessions. Do not say, what I have is small, or I don't have very much. Once God gets a hold of whatever it is you have, small things can become an instrument for the miraculous. Do not <coughs> despise small things. I'm very excited about our church expansion. We're getting closer and closer, aren't we? And yet, I know the, the people of our church very well. We don't have deep pockets. Does God care? Let's not despise small things. Each little drop as insignificant as it might seem that we put into the bucket, that bucket is going to get filled. Because whatever we do, whatever we turn over to God, it can become something remarkable. That's why I'm filled with hope. We serve an incredible God. Billy Graham tells the story of his grandson falling while he was running to his mother. He picked himself up and he brushed himself off and he says, Oops, I dropped myself. <laughs> <laughs> Only kids, eh? Oops, I dropped myself. What enabled God to make that rod an agent of the miraculous is that Moses did as God commanded. He dropped it. Actually, the wording is much stronger. He was told to throw it down. And so he just, he threw it. He cast it to the ground. He did as God told him to do. And the lesson that's inherent in that is that we need to throw ourselves and all that we have to God. We need to surrender. We need to, to, to lay it down, cast it down at God's feet. Yourself, your talents, your possessions, prayerfully sing, I surrender all. 
You know, we come to church and we think, oh, we're supposed to give one-tenth. <laughs> you know, the Bible, actually, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You know, in all your ways to acknowledge Him. Who talked about percentages? It's an all or nothing endeavor. There was a poor widow in the Bible, and by virtue of her being a widow, we know culturally she was a nobody. She thought of herself as being a very small, insignificant person. She was perceived by other people as being insignificant. A widow had no status and, and no resources, no monetary means. She had no way of earning income. In fact, somehow, maybe she had found it. She had the tiniest coin in her possession, a mite. I mean, it was a fraction of a cent. I have one at home. I mean, it even looks pathetic compared to all other coins. And yet, what did she do? As small as it was, it did not matter. She gave that to her Lord. And He commended her for it. It's not how much. It's what you do with how little. Bill Milliken writes, God doesn't ask us to give till it hurts. He simply asks us to give it all. So some of you might be thinking that if you did that, you might be bankrupt and homeless. If I gave God everything, we'll turn to the next slide, please. If I did that, I wouldn't have anything left. But this is not what God means when he says that you're to give him your all. In Exodus 4.20, the small little rod that Moses cut and he whittled down and then throws down is suddenly now called the rod of God. The rod of God. What an interesting expression. Something happened where the rod no longer belonged to Moses, but now it belongs to God himself. And when we cast our lives, our possessions, anything that is in our, our sphere, God becomes the owner of us and those things. And as the new owner, he doesn't take those things from us, but instead he entrusts us with them to use it for others and for his service. Martin Luther put it this way, I have held many things in my hands, and I have lost them all, but whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Jim Elliot says, He is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. We need to take all that we have and in prayer say to God, You're the owner. It belongs to you. The house I live in is the house of God. The vehicle I drive is the car of God. The children that I have birthed, raised, are the children of God. The abilities, that the talents that you have given me are the talents of God. Everything about me and my world is God's property. And with all of these things given to God, what he does is he gives them back to you. But something happens in the exchange. Because now in the exchange they become instruments of power that he will use, that he breathes life into. Really, when it comes down to it, what happens in prayer, in the exchange, is you're changing your attitude. Instead of using the word, mine, and I earned this, you realize that everything that is in your life is because of God's empowerment to begin with. He is the source of all things. How many of you believe that? Amen. Without him, what do we have? Yeah, you worked hard, but who gave you the strength to work? Who opened the doors to give you the opportunity? God excels at changing the value of what we are. In 1996, Jackie Kennedy Onassis' estate was expected to bring in about $5 million. Within the very first night, over $4.5 million was already achieved in the auction. A worn footstool sold for $33,350. A silver tape measure sold for $49,000. A tobacco humidor sold for $574,000. All common items, but they became valued because of who they belong to. And when our lives are placed in God's hands, and He is the owner, and we become just the managers, the value changes. Give your life to God. Give all that you possess to God. And the value of those things goes up in God's estimation. Something fascinating in Egypt. 
Pharaoh wore metal cobras on his crown. Have you ever seen Tutankhamun and some of the other mummies and the uh, different things that they were buried with? Well, look at that. What's on the forehead? Cobra. And where did Moses go to release the Hebrew people? He went to Egypt. The rod that he threw down turned to what? A serpent. Most likely a cobra. And it would be a lesson to Moses that God would use his small life and that small rod and demonstrate real power in the face of Egyptian power. The pharaohs. There's nothing that happens in the Bible by accident. It's all very intentional. And in the end, Pharaoh's heart, which was carved out of knotted oak and very hard, relented, and the Israelites were sent free. It's amazing. And so Zechariah asked this question. Who despises small things? Who dares despise small things? Do you think you're small and insignificant? What you have, compared to maybe others, is not much? Who dares despise small things? Because when you're turned over to God, all things are possible. All things are possible. My mom's here. I grew up in Midland. My name was Dougie Rowley. When I became a Christian, a gentleman in that community said, why would you go and waste your life like that? When I went off to Bible school, do you remember that, right? Why would you waste your life like that? And who would have thought that Dougie would do anything with his life? Probably, many of you don't know this, but grade 9 and 10, I barely passed any of my courses. I had mostly 50s, grade 9 and 10. But somewhere along the way, things changed. And what was small, what was insignificant, maybe in the perception of others, and it's certainly of myself. Who am I? And not that I'm anything great now, but I know, and I give credit to God, that I'm a lot more than I ever would have been if I hadn't turned my life over to God. And who knows what's yet to be for you or me. My life's in His hands. My life belongs to Him. What a great adventure. Small, don't you dare despise it. God's got his hand up. Heavenly Father. Today, as we celebrate with our children and we think of how small they are, we are reminded not to despise small things. For God, in our midst, there's children that are going to do incredible things because they turn their life over to you. And what a privilege it is for us to have an investment in their lives. But even for us, the end is not yet written. You are working out your grace in our lives, and it is yet to be what we are to become, together and individually. We put our faith and our trust in you, and we turn our life over to you. Your name, God, Yahweh, Jehovah, is on the deed to our lives. You are the owner. In Jesus' name.